Game of Queens is about, the women behind 16th century Europe, and huge tracts of Europe in the 16th century were being governed by a woman, either a queen regnant or else as a regent for an absent or an underage king. And we've kind of forgotten that a bit. The extraordinary thing is there are probably far more connections between the English powerful women like Catherine of Aragon, like you know Anne Boleyn, uh, later queens then, than, than, than we have now. You know, we really have forgotten a lot of this history. The one that stands out for me, the one I can't believe I didn't know more about, is Margaret of Austria. Now, she was the regent of the Netherlands in the early part of the, the 16th century, but she, she helped to raise the young Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn spent some time at her court. She was sister-in-law to Catherine of Aragon. But beyond all that, and beyond even her job as Netherlands regent, she became the kind of the fixer of Europe. Ferdinand of Aragon, who at one point had been her father-in-law, said that Madame Margaret is the most powerful person in Europe. She's the one on all whom depends, because she, she takes the lead in all the negotiations between the princes. And a few years later, she sat down with Louise of Savoy, of whom again we haven't heard, but you know, who was taking a very powerful role in France behind her son, King Francois I. So Louise and Margaret sat down, one representing her nephew, one representing her son, to negotiate the ladies' peace, so-called, of Cambrai. And again, it's very, it seems quite strange to me, especially with the interest in women's history now, that that's just completely been forgotten today. Oh, it probably began in my teens when I read a famous, a classic old book called Garrett Mattingly's The Defeat of the Spanish Armada. And he mentions as a throwaway line that how strange it was looking at Elizabeth I and Mary Queen of Scots, how, for how much of in the century before the roles, leading roles on either side of the religious divide had been taken by a woman. And I began thought, well, you know, that's interesting. Goodness, yes, that's true. Then I began looking at them, and I found first of all just how many there were, but also what strong links they had binding them. You've got mothers and daughters, aunts and nieces, mentors and protégés, and they were really conscious of these links themselves. You could actually see these women recognising bonds and forging alliances right across you know, the, the, the boundaries of the countries where they were married, sometimes even contrary to the country's interests. Because of course, you know, to be a woman then was seen as a major disadvantage. But when that ladies' peace was, you know, was in discussion, certainly Margaret of Austria was effectively writing to Louise, Savoy, Louise of Savoy that wouldn't it be great if the young men could get out of the way because, as she politely put it, they had their honour to consider. In other words, they were going to be doing a lot of posturing. And then they too, she said, how appropriate, on the other hand, for ladies to come forward in the cause of peace. So they really did see the plus sides as well as the negatives. Well, I think really the bit I don't like to peddle too much, but it's always there, is the question of whether this 16th century age of queens has any kind of ramifications for the present day. I mean, I was writing it at a time when a woman was preparing to contend the world's most powerful office. Of course, Hillary Clinton lost. But nonetheless, we are seeing England and Scotland led by women, Angela Merkel, Christine Lagarde, it does seem as though something is coming round again. And I like to think that maybe those earlier forebears had some lessons to teach them.